I'm thrilled to have Judge Guido Calabresi here today. At the end of my first day as a law student, I came home and told my wife I wasn't sure what to make of some of my courses. But I had a professor in a course called Torts, which I wasn't sure what that meant either. But th the professor was absolutely dazzling. Uh, first case in the book was something called Ives against South Buffalo Railway, a 1911 case from the High Court of New York. It was about 15 pages in the case book, so I wasn't surprised that we didn't finish it in one day. What I didn't realize was how many days we were going to stay on that case. And day after day, the professor would find something in the case that I hadn't seen and would use it to raise an array of questions ranging from the very practical to the deeply philosophical, spinning off countless hypotheticals. As my wife has reminded me, early on I began to refer to this professor simply as the magician. Uh, if one day he had reached into his pocket and pulled out a rabbit, it wouldn't have surprised me. Uh, that professor, of course, was Guido Calabresi. Uh, at that point, he was only in his 12th year of teaching at Yale Law School, a teaching career that now stands at more than half a century. He started there at the age of 26 in 1959 after a stunning series of academic successes, a summa cum laude graduate of Yale College, a Rhodes Scholar, valedictorian of his class at Yale Law School, uh, and then he took a year off to relax, clerking on the Supreme Court uh, for Justice Black. Uh, in 1970, the year before I had him, uh, he published the path-breaking book, The Cost of Accidents, and that really cemented his place as one of the founders of the field of law and economics. By 1985, he'd published three other books, Tragic Choices, A Common Law for the Age of Statutes, and Ideals, Beliefs, Attitudes, and the Law, along with numerous articles. In 1985, he became dean of Yale Law School, continued to write and to teach, while putting Yale at the heart of really interdisciplinary legal scholarship and making the law school even more of a magnet for outstanding faculty and students. In 1994, President Clinton named him to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals while distinguishing himself as one of the premier judges in the United States, he has still continued to teach at Yale and to write. I've had the great privilege not only of having him as a teacher, but of getting to know him as a person. And as impressive as he is as a scholar and teacher and jurist, he may be most impressive as a human being. His deep and genuine interest in his students, his generosity and kindness toward former students, even years later, are legendary. Throughout my career, as I've thought about how I should be doing my job, how I should be acting in different situations and toward others, I've often asked myself what two particular people would have done in my situation. The two people are, include, one, the Connecticut federal judge I clerked for on the Second Circuit right after law school, uh, Judge J. Joseph Smith. The other person is the judge who was appointed 20 years later after Judge Smith's retirement to the same seat on the Second Circuit, and that's Guido Calabresi. I'm sure he'll have some memorable things to say today. Please welcome him. Thank you. It's a great honor to be here, but also something of a challenge uh, because as I was preparing things to say, I saw a photograph in the New York Times of uh, what happened when Mercer beat Duke. And uh, there was a picture of a basketball player doing a dance. Uh, <laughs> like this. Uh, and I thought that that's really what I should be doing here. Uh, I decided that I couldn't do that and I'd better stick to law and law things. So you will not see me dance today, but I'd like to meet that guy because uh, that was good. That was good. Um, rather than give a speech, 
I tell stories, and I tell stories usually about me. Uh, that may be because I'm a judge, <laughs> maybe because I'm a teacher. So I'll tell two stories today which have to do with law and people and faith. The first story goes back to when I was clerking for Justice Black. In 1959, one of the major cases we had, there were two of them actually, Bartkus and Abate, dealt with the doctrine of dual sovereignty, of what you could try somebody who had been acquitted in a state, in another state, or in the federal courts, or vice versa, or convicted, you could try the person again. Um, Justice Black disliked this doctrine enormously. He thought that it violated the Constitution's language that no man shall be twice put in jeopardy. And he thought that it had only come in with prohibition. It had never been approved before by the Supreme Court. It had only come in with prohibition, uh, which he thought was a thing that destroyed law. He was against prohibitions. So he decided that he would write a dissent in which he wanted to go back and show that this had never been done until prohibition. And he wanted to do that because he wanted to tweak Justice Frankfurter, uh, who was not satisfied with the language of the Constitution that Black always relied on, and he wanted to go back and do a full history of things. And he knew he had a law clerk, me, who was a history buff, and so he said, let's go back and find out whether this has ever happened before. And off I went. I did research. I found this. I found that, that this had not happened, it hadn't happened, it hadn't happened. I found that St. Jerome said, God himself does not uh, punish people twice for the same offense. Uh, and that really struck a note because Frankfurter, when he was reading what his opinion in the case said, and this is the American Constitution we're dealing with, what St. Jerome said had nothing to do with it. And of course, Black was delighted because he'd always been saying, this is the American Constitution. <laughs> Uh, but then, then I found a statue in Tudor, England, in which the canonic courts and the king's courts could try somebody twice for the same offense. And so I said to myself, we cannot say this has never been done. I talked to another clerk, not a very sensible guy, and told him, well, too bad, we can't do this, I can't say this. And he said, well, say it anyway. And I said, I can't do that. And he said, well, you know, only a jerk like you would have done enough research to find this, just ignore it, act as if you hadn't found it. And I said, well, if I hadn't found it, I could say we haven't found anything, but I did find it. And so he said, your judge isn't going to like it. And I said, too bad. So I went to the judge and I said, judge, um, here is uh, an account of the statute. It's a contemporary account in another book of this statute, which allows the canon courts and the king's courts to try somebody twice. So I, we can't say that uh, this has never been done. The judge was not a bit phased. He looked at me and he said, Guy, he always called me Guy because he couldn't pronounce Guido. Uh, he said, Guy, have you looked at the original of that statute? And I said, Judge? He said, have you looked at the original of that statute? You've got a contemporary account here. And I said, Judge, this is a contemporary account of a statute from Tudor times you want me to find the original? He said, I'd sure be happier if you looked at the original of that statute. And I said, Judge, where am I going to do that? 
And he said, well, you know, you're a lawyer. Start looking. And he said, you might start here in the law library at the Supreme Court. We got the Elbridge Gary collection, which is a great collection of rare books. You never know what you'll find there. But look, because I'd be more comfortable if I saw the original of the statue, not some of her account. So walking away, swearing under my breath at this guy, here I'd done all this research and he wants me to go find the original of a statute from Tudor times. I call up the librarian of the court and I said, look, I'm very sorry. Uh, here is what I'm looking for is a statute from Tudor times. Do you think uh, you could help me? And she said, well, actually, I think I could because we have the book of statutes, which was used to teach Queen Mary Tudor the laws of England. And I said, what? And I, said, and I love history. He said, yeah, we have it. Uh, I'll bring it down to you. And I said, wow. Now, you know, loving history, this is the most exciting thing. So I started looking this. And by the way, there were annotations in a hand that the librarian says was that of Queen Mary. I don't know if it's true. But if it is true, she has gotten a mighty bad press. She was just as smart as Elizabeth and as Henry VIII and as uh, Henry VII. She, you know, her side lost out, and, and so we know what happens. But she was just as smart. I mean, these annotations were amazing. And I found the statute. And the statute, when I saw the statute, I laughed out loud. The statute was identical, identical. The only difference was it had a title. And I played it straight, and I sent, brought it to the judge, and I said to him, Judge, here's the statute. I'm afraid it's the same exactly the same, word for word. The only difference is in the title. There's a title here. And he looked at it, and his eyes lit up, because the title was an act dealing with the jurisdiction of the Court of Star Chamber. And I knew that what the judge would say, and you can find it in the opinions, the only instance in the history of law till prohibition was with the court, the net, that nefarious court of star chambers, which the framers were rebelling against when they wrote our Constitution. And I walked away saying, now how did that old man know that? He seemed very old to me then. He was younger than I am now by several years. How did that old man know that? He couldn't have known that when he sent me to look for that statute, for the original. And then I realized, of course, that he didn't know that, but that Justice Black had a faith in law, had a faith that the law represented the best instincts, the best doings of a society of societies that have all sorts of troubles and that if you look far enough, if you dig deep enough, if you work hard enough, you will find an answer that is the right one. You will find either where the law went wrong so you can bring it back or you will find that the law said this and it is helpful to what you're doing today. I cannot say that I am either as hardworking or have as much faith as Justice Black, but I must tell you that as a judge, when I have a case which I think is deeply wrong, I hear that voice saying to me, God, have you read the original of that statute? Have you read the original? I'd be more comfortable if you went and found it. 
and it pushes me to look and see whether the law really is what it seems to be or whether it is something more nuanced, deeper, more responsive to what the society really needs and to what is just. My second story is a sad story in a way, very sad. And it's a story about prejudice on my part and uh, a story that I call faith in human beings. Early on in my deanship, I had a, there was a graduate student from South Africa. His name was Christoph Heinz, and he was a wonderful kid. A white kid from a South Africa that was still involved, that still had apartheid, and he was just a wonderful student, marvelously open, arranged all sorts of things with African-American students and with African uh, uh, students of African background from other places and so on. He was all over. He was an open, wonderful, open, great kid. Um, smart and nice. And as the year came to an end, I asked him if he was going to be there for commencement. And he said, yes. And I said, are your parents coming? Because I really wanted to meet the parents from South Africa of a youngster at a time of apartheid who was so open and so wonderful in this. And he said, yes, cheerfully, they're coming. And I said, what do they do? And he said, my mother is a housekeeper. She brought us up and told me some things about, fine. And my father is the head of the Afrikaner church. Well, that hit me like a punch in the stomach because the Afrikaner church was the pillar of apartheid. It was the theological and theoretical basis for segregation and for treating blacks as well. And I said, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? How can I have anything to do with somebody who is the head of that church in that situation? On the other hand, I'm Dean. This is the father of one of my students, and a very good student, and he's coming that far. I can't snub him, but I don't want to have anything to do with him. And I remembered that my father, on one important occasion, which had something to do with the fact that we had to flee Italy, refused to shake Mussolini's hand. He would not do it. And so I argued with myself and argued with myself, and finally I said, well, I'll be civil, and I'll greet him, but I won't have anything more to do with him. And then the day of commencement, or the day before of commencement, arrived, and they appeared. My student's mother, very nice, charming, obviously an easy person to get to know, and the father looked like the caricature of the Afrikaner. Tall, thin, supercilious, looking, as Churchill said, of the great la labor chancellor of the exchequer, Sir Stafford Cripps, there but for the grace of God goes God himself. <laughs> you know. And I saw that and I said to myself, how can I deal with him? And then I said, okay, okay. He is the father of my son. I will greet him. I will be civil. And that will be that. And that was that. Commencement ended. Two weeks pass. And this man, whom I had treated civilly, but had not exchanged any significant words with, two weeks later announced not only 
that apartheid was wrong, but that apartheid was a sin. And that was the beginning of the end of apartheid in South Africa. And I said to myself, Guido, what a fool you are. Your prejudice, prejudgment, kept you from meeting this man and talking to him and learning about his journey because it obviously had been a journey of self-definition that brought him to make such a courageous and such an important statement. What an opportunity you had. And because you prejudged, because you did not have faith in the capacity of all human beings, you missed it. The story has a very sad ending because this man was actually murdered some years later by a racist who blamed him for the fall of apartheid in South Africa. And when that happened, in tears, I wrote a long letter to my student, Christoph, telling him about what I had done and what I had ought to have done and how sad I was. And he wrote me back a beautiful letter telling me his father's journey, how his father had come through faith, through thinking, through working to that realization and how Yes, he had been killed, but he died a happy person because he knew he had done the right thing. And that, I've seen Christoph many times since, made me feel better, and yet I kept thinking that I had failed because I didn't have faith in human beings. Today is Law Day. Law Day is a time for all of us to dedicate ourselves to having faith in law and faith in human beings. Faith in human beings to have the capacity to look deeper, to search for the original and there to find our way to that which can make our society, our nation, and our world so divided, so tragic, and yet so wonderful in its possibilities what it can be. Thank you.